Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Safir and Fide Jean, for inviting us to provide this presentation. It's always a good uh, opportunity for us to share word a little bit outside of our normal area of comfort. Uh, I don't know how many of you knows about the OE, uh, so just a few words to tell you who we are. Uh, we are an old international organization. We are the World Organization for Animal Health. We've been funded in 1924 following uh, the introduction of Rinderpest in Belgium uh, due to some zebus that were traveling from Africa to, to from India to uh, Brazil. So at that time, some of the uh, veterinary authorities were worried about this uh, rise in international trade in 1924. And so they decided to set together an organization to provide guidance and to uh, ensure safe trade. It was 1924 in Paris, and they instituted the Office, Office International des Episodies, OIE, uh, just to give you a little bit of a framework, like uh, the United Nations were founded uh, more than 20 years later. And then in 2003, we changed our name in World Organization for Animal Health. Uh, we are now quite different. We still have uh, our headquarters in Paris. We have now 12 regional offices around the world. We have 182 member countries. We have a wide network of reference centers all around the globe. And we do have uh, international agreements with uh, international partners, uh, 71 at the moment. We do implement the One World, One Health approach. And we do believe in the, that protecting animals would help us in preserving our own future. Uh, these are almost new director general. Actually, it's not that new now. And what is our global mandate? Well, the mandate of the OE is to improve animal health, veterinary public health, and animal welfare at global level. And how do we do implement our mandate? Well, we do follow a strategic uh, plan. Our last strategic plan, the sixth one, is for 2016, 2020. And as you can see, we have three main uh, objectives, which is reinforcing trust through transparency, supporting and strengthening veterinary services, and improving animal health and welfare by appropriate risk management. Of course, uh, to improve animal health and welfare, we do need to develop science-based guidelines and standards. And we identify three main uh, success factors for uh, implementing our strategy successfully, and excellence in science is one of them. So which is one of the reasons why I'm here, to show you how science is integrated in our standard developing process, and how the OE is trying to develop and support the um, implementation of new science to guide uh, animal, the protection of animal health and welfare worldwide. So what are OE standards? Well, the OE develops standards in relation to its mandate, which is namely for the prevention of control of animal diseases, as well as to ensure safe trade of animal and animal products. Uh, as it mandated under the SPS agreement of the World Trade Organization, we are one of the organization of reference for the WTO. Um, we have as well um, standards on diagnostic tests, vaccines, uh, veterinary laboratories and transport of biological materials for animal production, food safety and to promote science-based animal welfare and of course to improve the quality of veterinary services. We have four main standards, two codes, the terrestrial animal health code and the aquatic animal health code and two manuals, the terrestrial and aquatic manuals. Uh, the two codes contain uh, standards for the control of animal diseases and to ensure safe trade, while the manuals include uh, standards for the production of diagnostic tests, production and implementation of diagnostic tests, vaccines, and veterinary laboratories. All of these standards are available on the OI website and they are updated every year after the general session, which is a meeting that is held every year at the end of May in Paris, where all the representatives for the, uh, what we call the delegates from our member countries meet and they discuss and agree on new standards to be implemented. Before getting to our uh, standard setting process, I want to present to you uh, some of the uh, key pieces of the OE organization as to allow you to better understand how science is embedded in all the process we are following for developing standards. Uh, one of the main pieces are the specialist commissions. 
We have four specialist commissions. They are made up of experts. These experts are selected and voted during the General Assembly every three years. Um, they, their main aim is to use current scientific information to study problems of epidemiology, prevention and control of animal diseases, develop and revise the OE international standards, address scientific and technical issues that are raised by OE members. And in some cases, they can request or special expert groups for supporting them during their mandate. I will tell you a little bit more about what these other groups are. As I told you, we have four specialist commissions. I won't read through this. Anyway, please consider that each one of these uh, commissions has the mandate of ensuring that the standards in one of our book of standards are kept updated and are based on science. So we have one for the terrestrial animal code, one for the um, terrestrial manual, and we have one for the aquatic manual and code, and we have one scientific commission that assists in identifying the most appropriate strategies and measures for disease prevention and control, which kind of oversees uh, the overall science process uh, underlying the development of standards. We have, as I referred earlier, we have a wide uh, network of reference centers. These reference centers are really the backbone of the OA science, they are either reference laboratories, which are world reference center for expertise on design pathogens or diseases, and collaborating centers that are international centers of recognized expertise on more horizontal uh, issues. Um, their contribution to the work of the OE is at many levels. They often um, provide the expert that builds the scientific the specialist commissions. They provide us expert, for example, for the other group, we'll see in a minute. They answer to some specific questions that the OE is asked by the OE members, and they provide their expertise, they help us in the validation of diagnostic tests, and they ensure that all of our standards are kept updated. Another very important piece of our OE standard developing process are the other groups. These groups are a group of experts, are small groups, like about 10 people. Uh, they are built up of international experts uh, with a global reach, so we do a lot of efforts in ensuring that we represent a global view at any time we convene one of these groups. They might include some observers from uh, some stakeholder group, like the industry, for example, and they are the one that normally starts the drafting of any OE standard. The OE reference centers, as I was saying before, are the backbone for um, composing these groups, uh, even though we can draw expertise from other areas like academia, industry, NGOs, or other international organizations with whom we have um, relationships and official agreements. So this is, in brief, how the standard setting process is made at the OIE. So I'm colorblind, so I'm not sure if I see the red dot. I don't, so I'm not sure if it's there. I tried to point anyway. Is there? OK. So I hope I'm pointing a topic. So actually, a topic, well, whatever. Uh, actually, a topic is proposed, can be proposed to either one of the delegates or it could emerge during one of the OE global conferences, there are some every two years in different regions, or can be raised also by one of the international organizations the OE has a, an agreement with. This topic is delivered to one of the specialist commission. Which commission depends on the nature of the topic. If it relates to an animal disease, it's normally first the scientific commission, if it's an, an uh, aquatic animal disease, it will be the aquatic commission. If it's related to vaccine or biologicals, it's normally the uh, laboratory commission. This commission will review the topic and can either provide an answer to the delegates themselves, which is following, huh, it would be hard to see, following the, well, the big circle, so going to the delegates for comments, or in case they think this new topic that's been raised um, make arise the need for new standards, they can convene a dedicated other group. So the OE headquarters are mandated of summoning this other group and drafting term of reference for this group. We ensure that the group is composed by the top level expert at global level on the topic. 
And this group meet uh, for three days at the OE. They develop a draft that is then sent back to the special commission that review it if it is appropriate for them. They send it to the delegates for comments, delegates at a few months for commenting it, and send it back to the commission. The commission then revise the work, the, the comments that have been sent by the delegates, and can either answer and address the comment itself or send it back to another group if the amount of comment requires an expertise very specific that is not included into this commission. Then a second cycle starts. Is the uh, draft standard is sent again to the delegates for a second round of comment, again back to the commission for reviewing and addressing this comment. And only then, after two rounds, at least two rounds, it will go for adoption at the World Assembly at the OE in May. The member could decide to vote. Uh, normally, all of our standards are adopted by um, consensus. So, normally, one standard. Once the standard got to the World Assembly of Delegates, it is accepted. And for this, it's very important to ensure that all the rules that are included in the standards are following science. Because normally, the comments we are receiving from the delegates on standards are asking about the scientific rationale for the different prescription that we give for imposing certain trade restrictions, for example. So transparency and science base of these standards is fundamental and is getting more and more important. Our delegates are understanding more and more the importance of these standards that are um, binding. And for this reason, the work of the commissions and of the other group is increasing year by year in ensuring the scientific basis is sound. Once the member vote positively for the standard, this is adopted and included in either the code or on the manual. So this is um, the framework uh, process that is followed by any standards that is developed at the OE. The OE actually uses or supports science in other ways that I'd like to show you a few uh, case studies or examples now. Uh, for example, we don't just develop standards, sometimes we receive uh, specific questions that receive specific answer that not necessarily end up in the development of new standard. So we'll show you an example of that. Uh, the OE is also believes and understands that there are issues related to um, the lack of funding in research, duplication in research. So we do believe that prioritization of research topics is fundamental to ensure that the appropriate control tools are delivered in a timely way. So we do some work on prioritization of research, and we do work on research coordination as well in collaboration with the Staridas ISC, which is a network that I will describe you in a minute. So just to show you an example, a very practical example of a question we received uh, over the past few months, let's say, from our members, we do have in our terrestrial code um, the possibilities for some vector borne diseases, such as blue tongue, namely blue tongue. Um, we have the concept of seasonal freedom, which is based on the absence of cessation of activity of vectors for part of a year. Uh, during the seasonal freedom period, the trade um, prescriptions changes. So for exporting animals during this period, the uh, trade barriers are lower. Uh, we have been questioned by some of our members about the scientific validity of this uh, seasonal free period, as several scientific publications are showing now that uh, competent vectors are present even during the seasonal free period in some countries. And in addition to that, uh, emerging evidence shows us uh, climate change as an influence in vector density and distribution. So. We did start working on that a few years ago. This is a publication that was published on the, uh, one of the OE publications that have viewed uh, science, and technical, uh, science and technical reviews of the OE, uh, which shows as vector range changes for some vectors and climate changes and impact of it. So the OE member country asked the Scientific Commission uh, to check if the concept of seasonal freedom is still valid. Uh, the Scientific Commission met, provided some uh, guidance to us, to the headquarters, and this is the approach 
we agreed to follow to answer this question. So we'll perform a literal review uh, to provide the scientific basis to assess the validity of vector-borne disease seasonal freedom. If we will see that this concept is still valid, then we'll need to set some criteria, some clear criteria for saying when this seasonal free period applies and to which country and which context. And in addition, we will look at the impact of climate change on these criteria that influences uh, seasonal freedom. This literature review will then present it to our OE reference center network, to the relevant ones, the one dealing with vector borne diseases, namely. And after their, validation, their evaluation, this evaluation will be sent again to the scientific commission that will then decide if it's, there is need to convene another group of experts to eventually revise the chapter or to provide other kind of uh, recommendation or guidance to the members for addressing this issue at international level. One of the other areas where the OE is involved with research, I was saying, is prioritization. The OE is more and more working on um, antimicrobial resistance, which is a global issue. We do know that the One Health approach is necessary to address the problem, and the veterinary side is moving forward very fast on the topic. Uh, one of the things we are doing since uh, most likely all new uh, therapeutics or all new antimicrobials that will be produced will be restricted for use in humans, we are trying to invest in prevention, and so vaccines. So the OE convened two other groups, one in May 2005 and one in May this year, uh, for the prioritization of diseases for which vaccines could reduce antimicrobial use in animals. The aim of this group was to try to identify which were the diseases that were causing the most relevant antimicrobial use and which still were lacking uh, effective vaccines at global level and suggesting then a, a priority list of diseases to be addressed by researchers as to ensure the reduction of antimicrobial use and then the risk of new antimicrobial resistance emergence. Uh, the two groups apply the same methodology as to ensure the consistency of results. Um, they started identifying the most prevalent and important bacterial infection associated with high use of antibiotics at global level and for the different species. And then, in addition to that, which is something different to what is done, for example, by the WHO, with whom we are working a lot on AMR, we also look at non-bacterial infection as uh, quite often uh, the treatment is done on an empirical basis, uh, based on the symptom without appropriate diagnostic being implemented. So in some cases, protozoal or viral diseases are actually entailing the high use of antimicrobials and or could result in bacterial co-infection that then need to be treated with antibiotics. So for that reason, these other pathogens were considered. Uh, they develop a template and some guiding criteria for the ranking of diseases and I show you in a second. So this is more or less the kind of information you will find in the report of these other groups. So these are the disease prioritization parameters that were followed. So we identify, they identified the key syndrome and the primary pathogens that are involved in the syndrome. And then they classified the, antimicrobial, the antibiotic use between low, medium, and high. We tried to provide a a figure at global level. In some cases, some diseases are very prevalent in some regions, but not in others. So in this case, we try to weight the answers as to provide a more global uh, perspective of how much was the antimicrobial use related to disease. Then we look into um, the existence of commercial vaccines, uh, actually the existence and the adequacy of the existing vaccines. We had stakeholders participating in this meeting. We have some observers from Health for Animals in both meetings. Health for Animals is the umbrella organization representing the pharmaceutical industry in the veterinary world. And that helped us a lot in understanding better which were the different uh, vaccines that were existing. And then the group identified which were the major constraints to use of vaccines or related to the development of these new vaccines that were lacking. And they set a three-scale priority for each of these uh, disease, vaccine-related to diseases that could be low, medium, and high. As um, a result, as an outcome of these groups, we had several tables 
uh, identifying priority diseases for which vaccines could reduce antimicrobial use for pig, poultry, fish, cattle, sheep and goats. Um, the one on cattle, sheep and goats has been held in May. So in two weeks, we'll have a meeting of our scientific commission that will evaluate the result of the other group and assess its validity. If it would be um, assessed positively, it will be published on our website in the next few months. Else, the scientific commission might decide to reconvene the group uh, to work again on the topic. Apart from these lists uh, that were the main outcomes, the group identified also some horizontal priority research gaps, such as the interference of material antibody, cross-protection, the occurrence of immunological interference in multivalent vaccine, um, the development of innovative delivery system to enable mass vaccination. This was true especially for fish and poultry. And some general recommendations. I'm just listing a few of them because that's why it would have been very long. Uh, just to uh, let you understand the level of detail that this report contains. Of course, the lists are much more detailed, but it makes no point of having them. You can find all the documents on our website, and I can actually provide you information about it later if you want. Um, among the general recommendations we received was to establish a global vaccine research network to pull resources and expertise into address the gaps for each of the priority diseases, and to establish public-private partnerships as to ensure that the identified gaps were brought to the industry to ensure the development of the needed control tools. A last example I want to show you is the collaboration of the OAE with the Staridas International Research Consortium. This is a global forum of public and private R&D program owners and managers on animal health. Uh, this group was established to coordinate research at international level to contribute to new and improved control uh, strategies for at least 30 priority diseases or infection or issues. Um, the different deliverables would include uh, candidate vaccines, diagnostic, new therapeutics, uh, procedures or even key scientific information that would help the control of these diseases. This group to date has 24 partners. Uh, 18 of them are private, are, sorry, are public funders from 15 uh, countries around the world. We have some international bodies that are involved in the consortium. We have umbrella organization for the uh, pharmaceutical and diagnostic industry. And we do have uh, one big donor, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and one other um, private company involved in the development of veterinary drugs. All of these partners agreed and signed a letter of intent uh, agreeing a minimum level of investment on animal health on the selected priorities of at least $10 million over five years' time. Uh, they agreed to follow the delivery targets that will be uh, advised by the Steroides IRC. They agreed to coordinate and line the funding to deliver these targets and to share research results. The overall amount of funding this consortium would have, this consortium would have is more than $2.5 billion. This doesn't mean this consortium has this money, uh, but it means that the partners of this consortium has this money that they have committed to spend on this topic. <coughs> the OE is an associated partner, as we are not funding research uh, as uh, ourselves, and we have a seat in the executive committee. This is very briefly, uh, which is the overall governance structure of the Saridas IRC. So we have a, an executive committee. I have no idea where I'm pointing. Nowhere. Uh, where we have an executive committee. We have a scientific committee, which provides uh, independent advice to the uh, executive committee. We have a secretariat. The OE co-hosts the secretariat. I'm actually working on the secretariat at the OE in Paris. There are other uh, members of the secretariats at DEFRA in the UK, BBSRC in the UK, at CABI and at Health for Animals, Europe. And the executive committee meets every year to decide new priorities on which to build working groups, which are expert groups that meet with the aim of identifying research gaps and drawing research roadmaps that could lead to the actual state of the arts, to the delivery of needed control tools on the selected priority diseases. Uh, in 2017, which was the first meeting of the executive committee, 
uh, six main priority areas were selected, which were vaccinology, African swine fever, helminths, including anti resistance, PERS, brucellosis, and bovine TB. And in 2018, uh, it's impossible to read that, but anyway, the first one is uh, integrated approaches to fight um, antimicrobial infections, which include alternatives to the antibiotics, coronaviruses, diagnostic, vector-borne disease, and foot and mouth disease. The OE has different roles in this organization, as I told you. So we are co-hosting secretariat. We are sitting in executive committee. We are supporting the working groups, providing experts, either directly from our reference centers or through our commissions or through our publications, so we can actually have uh, bibliographic studies to underpin the work of these working groups. And building on our network, we are trying to uh, support the enlargement of the consortium and to build awareness about it at global level. This is, just to let you know, uh, it's very difficult to see. Anyway, uh, the, there is a new website for the Staridas ISC, and on this new website uh, have been unloaded, uploaded the first uh, research roadmaps that were produced in this first year and a half of work of the consortium. There are roadmaps for the development of vaccines for bovine TB, uh, PERS, and brucellosis. There are some others coming on African swine fever and FMD, and, and FMD diagnostics. We do have a meeting tomorrow of our scientific committee that would revise the work that has been done up to date um, on these uh, roadmaps and that will advise about new priorities to be uh, considered for next year. For concluding, um, I would like to highlight that the OE is a science-based organization. We've always been based on science but the relevance of science inside the OE is increasing, so we really understand the importance that science has to find effective ways to control infectious diseases and to ensure that the trade of animal and animal commodities is safe. We do know that when standards are based on science and produced in a transparent way, in which science is again a component, they are more easily accepted at global level, so it actually increases the level of implementation of our standards. We do believe that national and international collaboration is fundamental to ensure the delivery of, the timely delivery of control tools for ensuring the protection of animal health at global level. And we try to build direct connection with the funders to deliver the identified priorities to the funders and ensure that these public-private partnerships exist and are uh, positively affecting the development of new products. And with that, I'm finished, and I thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. I think that a uh, lot of us who were not familiar with OIE have been uh, discovering a lot of, uh, of, of your role that, for example, we, we don't know wh why is the ban on or some, uh, some trade of, uh, of, uh, of any food products and because there are some standards and so on, and the link with research. So, um, there are some questions for Stefano for further explanation. Yeah, okay. To, to what degree do, do, do politics, political issues yeah. interfere or with scientific issues? I mean, in the end, it's people have to decide. And does politics in, intervene or...? Well, yes. There is, uh, of course, a, uh, a political level. Uh, of course, trade is involved, so money is involved. So, of course, there, is a, there are political pressures. Um, since our standards are based on science, uh, what, even when a political reason is there, a scientific rationale supporting the political position should be looked after. So more and more countries are sometimes funding studies to find um, um, elements to support their own needs. So it is good to see that even in this process, science is underlying everything because without a scientific basis, actually standards aren't modified or adopted. And I think we, we could see or 
try to see also the, 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 the speed uh, in which, well, the, the, the research results are going sometimes quite fast for education, and at the same time, you are, uh, uh, the, the, you are the, the keeper of, the, of the, the standard. So you need to this process which looks heavy, but which is needed to, to validate. So there, there might be also a conflict between the, the political uh, timing, the research timing, yes. and, and your timing. So it doesn't make it yeah. easy. Uh, That's a reality. There, there, is, there are some times that are needed for us that sometimes are unacceptable or uncomprehensible for people working in the research labs, but still you need uh, to have a proper validation of the standards before their implementation. So yeah, we try to have a, a process as smooth as possible, but still it's true, it requires some time. Yeah, but and, and at the same time we, we know uh, your the impact you can have on the on the on the call we can respond to for example uh, on yes. Europe so it's important that the, the what we bring to you is validated so that it can come on a validated list and then come into the proposal we can apply of course to. so this is uh, this interaction is, is really very important no oh yeah there is a question back <coughs> When you, you're looking at things like antimicrobial resistance and, and kind of removing antimicrobials from the system, one of the, uh, you know, there's a number of solutions appearing out there, things like phage solutions, um, uh, enzyme solutions, CRISPR solutions even. Uh, do, you, do you try when you kind of look at these different solutions and verify these different solutions, do you try and also resolve the regulatory issues that, with, that, that exist with those kinds of solutions? Because one of the biggest problems for industry is that the, for those more unusual uh, solutions, regulatory is the, is the biggest risk and the biggest problem because they don't know whether they're going to get triggered into pharmaceutical regulations or they'll stay as feed additive regulations. So there's, there's real issues there and do you try and kind of interact with the regulatory bodies? So we do have a lot of interaction with the regulatory bodies on the vaccine and diagnostic side. Uh, we don't have it on the therapeutics. In fact, our manuals, that are guiding uh, the regulatory bodies at world level, uh, only covers vaccines and diagnostics. We don't cover therapeutics. Our work on therapeutics is at the moment limited to uh, ensuring the control of antimicrobial resistance and the appropriate use of antimicrobials. In addition to that, we are trying to sustain the development of alternatives to antibiotics. We have been working with USDA um, for several years. We organized a couple of meetings, um, which were alternative to antimicrobials, uh, the antibiotics meeting. We were, they were held at the OIE, one in 2016 and the other one in 2012. We have a new one coming next year. We have regulators participating in this meeting, but the OE itself is not uh, providing guidance to regulators on the therapeutic side. Okay. Well, thank you, Stefan. Okay.